right. I think it's a little bit bigger now. Okay. So on the machine, so let's continue. So we just review what you're supposed to do on the machine for me. On the machine, everybody should have a DBMS underscore your username on there, right? So um, the last 30 minutes of class, those who don't have it or can't see it, you should ask so that we get it set up. There are some people that connected, but what happened is after they connected, they would check, um, let me see if I switch user to, for example, myself. Switch user to, so this is with party, right? Switch user to myself, and if I just type MySQL, and I say show um, databases, you will not see any databases. So some people connect and they tell me they can't see databases. And that's because the user that you are right now is an anonymous empty user. You don't have a username, you don't have anything. So what I said in the tutorial um, was you should say MySQL-hosts and specify the full path. So 5211, uh, 52, 89, 116, 249. That's you specify your user, right? And P, that you want to specify a password. If you don't specify username and password, you will not be able to have access to the secure data that belongs to you. So everybody has a username password. But if you just connect, it will be a default user, empty, you can't do anything on it. Okay, now when I say show databases, see now it shows all of them. So please, those who are connected to party and can't seem to show the databases, it just means that you will have to fully connect, specify your host and username and say that you want to connect as a specific user with the password. Right. So if you can get to party, you can get to this. And it's the same thing for MySQL. That is, um, if you come to Workbench and you add a new connection, sorry, same principle, the host should be here, the username. Right. And you can test your connection, you ask you for password before you continue. So, sorry. Um, 5289 116249. My user is KJ and test connection. Oh. Did I click enough? connected at parameters are okay. All right. right. So once saved, then you can keep connecting to the machine. If you connect to the machine, right, one of the commands that you can run is to set your password. So please, since you are now in a shared environment, your new password, right, you can use this set password equal to a new password. That means that you are changing your MySQL password, not your Unix password, the, the party. This won't change the party password. MySQL is different from Unix. Unix is what allows you to connect with party and then type the commands, right? That, has a, that is a different password from this one. We created the usernames, we made them the same. We did that ourselves. So if you change the password for one, it won't necessarily change the password for the other. Yes, um, but if you were changing your password in party, so the password here, this user here, sorry, let me just do this. Um, when you are in party like this, right, this is a Unix environment. It means that the username password supplied here, where you see KJ or Safmafo or your user as some IP, 
it means that what? You are using Unix right now. If you want to practice some commands in Unix, LS and so on, it's possible. Or CD, possible. You want to compile some programs on this machine. Um, sorry, GCC. Okay. Um, I don't think that this code is correct. But you can compile programs on this machine. But if you want to change your password on Unix, it's PASSWD. PASSWD. In this shell, then you can change your password. But this password will not change your MySQL password. Right. Pians. Sorry. No. Is it a bit better? All right, so in Unix, you type P A S S what? W D. That will change the Unix password. I hope you're understanding. The password that is like your Windows password. So in Windows, you have a username password that you type when you are logging into Windows. But when you log into Windows, MySQL has what? A different username and password. Most of you are using roots and something else. If you change your root password, it doesn't mean you have changed your Windows password, right? They are different things. Similarly, for this machine, when you get on there, the first you see is some command prompt. It will look a lot like, uh, sorry. It will look a lot like this. It says your username at some address. This is Unix, right? And you can type PASSWD, and then you can change your password. You are encouraged to do this so that another student can't go into your your stuff and take your things. So please, to preserve the, what's it called, the honor code and all of that. If you can get in here and you are starting to use the machine, change your password so that what another student cannot go in there and pick up your things. But right now, your username and password are the same. So security, please, do so. All right, so if you say password, it will ask you to enter your old password and you can enter a new one. I don't want to change my password. Now, in Unix, as in Windows, you can type other programs. So here you can do Python, for example. Too bad um, discrete mathematics has ended, but okay. You can also type MySQL. What I said was, if you do MySQL like this, it's only going to connect as a default user. This is not a real user that can do much. So if you say, um, maybe show data, Come on, show databases. You only have the default schemas, the schema and the test. The test, everyone can use the test by MySQL standard. This database here, everyone can go there and can create any table they want, insert anything they want, right? Even as a guest user. So this user can go to tests. Oh, sorry, not CD test, right? It's what, use test. And then I can create table my table ID int, right? Everybody can do this. But he doesn't have access to any other schema right. because he's a default user. So if you, sorry, I'm mixing too many languages. I just did Python. Okay, exit. All right. If you want to connect, you should say what? MySQL, the host, 52, um, 89, One six two four nine. The user, and then the last parameter is dash p, which tells you that what you want to supply a password. So currently, oh, did I just change my password? You know, I just connected, and then okay, or well, someone went and changed my password. It's possible. <laughs> okay, so these are some of the dangers of not changing your password quickly when you get access. Yeah, I was, I was. <laughs> All 
Okay. I, okay, so hopefully, so, um, okay. The thing is, right now, I'm live on the screen, so anything I make, everyone will see. All right. So please, to change your password, say set password, and you can specify what the password that you want. So you realize that says password equals password. This is a function that will encrypt the password that is being stored. Right. So you can do this to set your password. So please perform these actions so that what somebody, so my, I think the person has added a digital. Please don't go and change my password again. Uh, you can use this to change your password so that what another student can go in, take your, your things. But remember that if you change this password, it is not what the Unix password. It's not the party SSH password. This is still within my SQL only. Right. So a uh, few questions before we continue. So I'll just take two, three minutes questions. At the end of the, so those who can't access it, I'll give 30 minutes at the end so that I'll solve those issues so you can submit by tonight. Right. So are there any questions about how Linux MySQL works as you're using it now? Yeah, all cool. <laughs> So that means that if you went to work for somebody and they said there's a server somewhere, connect and work on it, I'm expecting that most of you should be able to do this. Right. So if it's a, a Linux machine, you just ask, what is my username, what's my password? Or if you want, you can also just connect directly by what finding the credentials and then you can put it in something like Workbench. You can enter, connecting here, you can enter what your username and password that you can access. So everyone is cool. All right. It doesn't affect the MySQL. So if you change, so if you do PASSWD, it will not affect MySQL. No, it won't touch your database. It will still be the same. That's why I'm saying that in here, you have to type... So when you're in MySQL, so not the same MariaDB. MariaDB is a version of MySQL. It has the same commands, everything. So in here, you say set password equal to password, and then you type what your new password is. So that is, this would change just MySQL password. And it's a good idea to do this so that other students don't do I have a hacking competition at the end of the class, but not right now. All right, so back to the excitement of functional dependencies. So what I do every semester is I go through, so someone was asking last time, the rules of functional dependencies. Right. Now, I know that in databases, a lot of it has to do with the practical parts, writing queries. But another part too has to do with the analysis of the data. Yes, so that is, that's why we're learning all the rules. So after this, we'll do, so today we'll go to normalization. First, second, third normal form. Normalization will then be removing the different types of errors that we'll encounter. But before, we just look at the rules so that if someone gives us a table and some rules, we can then systematically remove all possible errors. Right. Yes, it's recording. Um, 14 minutes. It zoomed into a part of the screen because I realized that the resolution was high, so I'm doing about half of the screen and using that for presentation. All right, so the first rule has to do with reflexivity, right? So there are many, many, many of them. I think there's rule zero, which, okay, I'm just, the trivial functional dependency. Remember, I said that there's something like a trivial functional dependency in that if someone gives you some columns, maybe age, name, height, it's trivial to say that age, name, height gives you height, or to say that age, name, height should give you name and height. So this is a trivial functional dependency. These are things that it just logic, logically makes sense. 
that if I have two things, it implies the other. Discrete math two, the same would have been there. Where I would say maybe P implies P. It's, it's not something interesting. Or PQ implies PQ. It, it's not anything interesting. Or A or B implies A. It's the same. There are some things which you don't need any, any extra brain to figure out. Right. All right, so let's do the first one. So these rules you'd also see in discrete math. Actually, in a lot of mathematics, the rules you see are not sets, graphs. They are similar to the rules that you are going to see here. Right. Similar things. So the first one is saying reflexivity. If x is a subset of y, then x determines y. So it's something, OK. So let's pick a set. So let's, for example, let y sorry, be equal to age, name, and height. And you let your x be equal to age. So someone can say that x determines y. And it's, it's easy to see why it's so, right? If a fact remains, so logically, if there's a fact about something, Adding extra things doesn't what? Negate it. So, if, for example, I can say first name, middle name, last name implies first name, middle name, last name, date of birth. If I have already one part, some of it, I can what? Keep adding more columns. It doesn't make any difference to it. So, that's the first one. If x is a subset of y, so that means if it's part of it, you can what? You can append more things. This was also in discrete math. In this script mark, we have where there's a rule, and then maybe there's A, and then you can say A implies A or B. You can, it's the same concept, right? I hope people are not forgotten their discrete mathematics. You didn't do discrete math. Some of you did data structures. Yeah. Ah, I don't know if you have done discrete math. Okay. Okay, so let's, let me write in set theory, right? Um, if x, okay. So we'd say um, like this x implies x or y. So it means that if something is already there, adding more to it, it isn't going to change the truth of what's coming out of it. So in, uh, in functional dependency sense, if something is a subset of something, then what? You imply the rest of it. So that's the first one. Right. So for example, it says if you have all of these, so using reflexivity. So if someone has um, x is subset of, OK, I think I didn't write this thing properly. Yeah, I think I've swapped it to subset of y. Okay, so if I have these attributes, A, B, C, D, yeah, these are all trivial. It doesn't make any, yeah, these are equal. Hello. Say it again. Yeah, it should, it should also work from the other way around. This is the trivial one. Let me just check. This is the trivial fun. This I'm very sure. Please let me check on this one. I have to check how I've written this reflexivity. So please hold. Let me check on this one. The example I know is correct. This one is correct by the trivial law. Remember the trivial ones where I say something is trivial. That was the first one I started with. That if you have a set of things, you can always conclude that you imply a subset of it. Let me just double check the reflexivity before we continue. Has anyone looked at the rules already or nobody? So please hold, let me just double check from the text. Reflexivity, um, nope, it's not this one. Trivial, nope. Closure, nope. Transitive. The book doesn't include a reflexivity one. 
So please hold and let me check. So please put a pin in this one. I'll double check. There are many rules. I tried to gather all the rules I could find. I think this one, I have to check how I've written it. I have to check. Okay, so the next rule after this question. So in this week mark, we say that given things like if A holds, B holds, C holds, D holds, we can conclude that A. Right. So it means that if someone, so for example, if I say, oh, if I have your first name, middle name, I can determine your first name. It's, that's what it just means. That if I have your, maybe if I have your, um, let's say your date of birth, your age, I can determine your date of birth. It just means from the set of information I have, I am determining a sub of it. And that will always be true. Right. It's not about the uniqueness. It's not about the uniqueness. At this stage, it means that everybody implies everybody else. So if you, you take this, it actually means that A, B, C implies A, A, B, C implies B, A, B, C implies C, and A, B, C also implies B, and all of them together, but you've sort of broken them into pieces. Right? So you can say that everybody implies part of himself. So implies means I can use what I have to determine. To determine. But you already have the information. D is already there, so you didn't really have to do any work to conclude what you had to Um, okay, so this one, I think, this one is in this book though, augmentation, right? So augmentation, and this you've seen in discrete math as well, or even in sets. That is, if you have something determine something else, you can add two facts to both sides, and you'll be fine. You will see something like this in mathematics, where someone says maybe um, 6 is equal to 3 plus 3. And then you can add 4 to either side, and you'll be fine, right? In mathematics, we do this all the time, right? Or if there are two sets, and one set has A, B, and C, and another set has A, C, B, you can what, extend, so long as what, what you do on one side, so if this holds, then I can also conclude that whatever the set was, if I added something here, and added something on the other side. It should be the same. Right. So augmentation is used to say that if I have a rule, I can what? Expand it by adding to both sides the same attributes. So starting from x implies y, I can have x z implies y z. So let me use one. So for example, if someone says um, username determines password. This is something that we all know. Usually, once you have the username, it should lead you to some password, some specific password. Right. If this is there, and then I augment it. Augmented means that I can say first name, username, implies first name, I'm using the word implies, but implies is not the right word. It's functionally determines. So that means that if I have one where I say use, username determines password, I can just what, add a column to either side. And this is also true, trivially so. Because you knew that okay, this determines this. But it is also true. The reason why I work is everybody already knows that what I can write first name determines first name. And by combining the two, first name, username determines what? First name, password. So you can combine rules to generate more rules. So when I shift it, okay, I can't go. Because you follow, 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 Um, currently, the way it's working, if it, if it breaks, then you have to warn us. Because currently, what everybody's uh, password should be going against your email. So I think it does two things. Checks your email to see if you exist. If you don't exist, you can. That's why since we join struggle a bit. Your, your email has to be there. Checks it. And the second part is there's a database within um, the SIS itself that focuses on it. So it checks that one. 
And there's also a database, so that's like three levels, a database within courseware itself. So it, it checks all three before you can. So in Ashes's case, it means your username determines about three passwords. Right. So oh, we can extend it more and more, but we try not to go crazy so that things don't get too complicated. We can add more things, but if you add more, then the complication will be the maintenance of the code becomes an issue. So we try to keep it simple. All right, so let's look at this one. Right. So why this one is going to hold? So is it true that if Z implies Y, right? So let's go through. So to prove this, the way that these are normally proved to, a way to think of a proof for this is that you can put together some information. So in this case, Someone has provided, so that is, I provided for you. I think you have to do more of this. You have to do more of this. Sorry. Just a sec. Let me just phrase the question properly. All right. Can you prove that Z implies Y? So one of the things that we'll be doing is, sometimes you have some data. So this is some random data that I've provided. And you are being asked, is it true that Z implies Y? What would you have to do? So first of all, you have to check and see all the parents of what? Z to Y, to see if, if it will actually make sense. So to check to see if it actually holds, we'll have to come up with some examples to say, okay, anytime I want to go from Z to Y, I'll have 3 to 2, 3 to 2, 3 to 4. That's a violation, right? What's the problem? There's no, there are no nice column names. There's no sets. Like, you don't know what Z and Y are. And that is the exciting part. So in databases, we'll get to a point, and we are getting to that point, and you are seeing it in the textbook now, that chapter one and chapter two was very much, every example will give you first name, middle name, um, what's it called? Like, movie studio and so on. But part of mathematics or logic is, even if you just have the data and someone gives you the rules, you should still be able to reason about it. You can be given even data in points like this. I can give you this. So for example, we can give you, and I think people have heard about um, of, um, obfuscation. That means data is there and it's twisted so that you don't even know where it came from. So someone can give you some data and can ask you to do some analysis. right? So even if you don't know that, okay, this is, um, Maybe Nestle, and this is, uh, okay, maybe three is Nestle, C is Unilever. Even if the data is twisted, right, has been substituted with something, so long as the substitutions are constant, two people should still arrive at the same conclusions. Right? So you'd see this more and more throughout the textbook, especially in the functional dependency part, that you'll get to a point where we would sometimes give you just, okay, here are some columns, here is some data, can you reason about it? and come to some conclusion for us. Sometimes when we put in the age, name, and so on, what happens is people would just use their normal natural powers, right? People would just say, oh, okay, username should give me password, and then they'll go along and follow, right? But that doesn't mean, so it's almost like um, when children are learning to count, and maybe because they are very good at counting with like four or five fingers, and so anything that you do here that involves these, something they know about, they can tell you the answer. If you say 2 plus 2, very quickly, you'll tell the answer. But the test becomes, what if the data is something that you are all not too familiar with, but the structure is there? Can you still what, reason about it? So in this text, a lot of the questions, you'd see it in this format. Right? So for this one, it's not really hard. It just means that whatever it is, just go through systematically. Someone is asking, is it true that Z gives you Y? You can start testing. OK, this to this, is that possible? Three to two, three to, but by the time I get here, no, I'm finding that it fails. Right. So the rule is, so to say that this doesn't work, so I'll say that, okay, you know what? Three gives you two, but what? Three is also giving you four. So it is not a functional dependency. So here I'll try and list, um, so someone can say, for example, this is an example of augmentation. If one determines two, someone can say, okay, then I can add three to each end. If 5 determines 2, so if x determines y, 
I can add what three to either end. So some of these is showing you that oh, you can generate a lot of rules. Some of these rules may help you answer the question, but some of them, when you look at the data, is just to say prove by contradiction if three is giving you two and three is giving you four, then what? It is violating the definition of a functional dependency because from every value you should be able to lead to a unique value, but in this case it is not leading to a unique value, so it's wrong. Documentation. So in this one, what it's just asking you is, is it true that Z gives you Y? I try to do some analysis on the side, just to see, okay, what are some of the rules I can get from this? Can I say that X leads to Y? Okay, one goes to two, one goes to three. That one's, it's not going to hold, right? Because one is leading to. Someone can also say, okay, what if I go from Y to X? Two to one, that doesn't work. Two to five, because what? There are two different values, right? I can also try Y to Z. Two goes to three, two goes to three, four goes to three, D goes to three. Okay, so Y does lead to Z for this data that I have. I hope people are okay. So the ones have come up with so far. So we are trying to test. There are only there are only three um, columns, right? So I can think of okay, I can do x to y, I can do y to uh, y to x, um, I can do y to z, or sorry. Or Z to Y. I think there's, I'm missing something. There's one more combination. Um, yes, X to Z. Right? These are all the possible rules that can exist. So the question now becomes given these rules, which ones can I say are true or are false? We are trying, so the question specifically asks about Z to Y, but we can still analyze and see, are these holding? X to Y, it's not going to hold because what? I have one to two, but in other case I have one to four, so that one is out, right? Next one is Y to X. Y to X, I have two to one and two to five. So the first two, so this is no. Nope. This is no. Nope. What about Y to Z? Y to Z. Two leads to three, two leads to three, four leads to three, B leads to C. Is this holding? This is one that a lot of people get out, I don't know, they get confused by. So using the password example, right? If someone says username gives password, right? Is it valid for me to say that maybe Kofi Password is one, two, three. That's a bad password. And Abena's password is one, two. Is this valid given the functional dependency? Yes, it is. That username determines password. It doesn't matter if they are all ending on the same thing. Functional dependencies are asking about the starting point. What can you determine based on the starting point? It doesn't ask anything or claim anything about the ending. So this is something you have to watch out. So if I say, for example, if I say social security number, so another one, social security number should determine first name and last name. Right. Can I say that if one person, 101, is Kofi Mensah, the other person, 102, can also not be Kofi Mensah? As far as functional dependencies, if this determines this, this is fine. All it's saying is that if you go and meet another 101, it better be Kofi Mensa. But it's not saying that nobody else can end up at Kofi Mensa. So when you're reasoning about functional dependencies, this is one that trips people up a lot, where they see a conclusion. I think in this street one, this was, um, there was something we called this, asserting the conclusion. There was something that maybe you, um, let me try and find, does any, can anyone give me one from this script map? Where something implies something, and then someone says, what's the right way to put it? 
My district map is, is my examples are, are running away. It's the same, the work for implications. It doesn't say anything doesn't about say it. Yeah. So the discrete math people are, have some examples that they can use, right? That is, just having the conclusion, if you know a rule, having the conclusion doesn't preclude others from happening. Right? This is a fact by itself. Starting from here, I can get to here. This is a separate fact. Starting from here, I can get to here. It doesn't say that the two are not allowed. Because for the functional dependence definition, just say that what? If you agree on this, you have to agree on this. They are not even agreeing on the beginning. So the ending is not something we are arguing about. So x, um, let's see. Y to z is something that is holding. Oh, sorry. This one is yes. And z to y is not holding because what? You can have 3 to 2, but 3 also goes to 4. So that's not going to work. So this is no. What about x to z? So 1 to 3, 1 to 3, 5 to 3, that one is holding, right? Because anytime I have a unique value, so x, when it's 1, I'm always led to 3. Anytime I have 5, I'm led to 3. There's the only one 5, and a leads to c. So this one does hold, yes. And z to x, 3 goes to 1, 3, okay, that one is not working because what? 3 is going to 5 as well. So that's a conflict situation. Right. So it means that some of the rules hold and some of them do not hold. You should be able to do this. It doesn't matter. The reason why I write this is even if the information is in Chinese, I can normalize it. It doesn't matter. You just look at the symbols and what? You match them up. It's like a game. Say, if this term is this, that should always hold. Okay, here's another one. If B, C, if A, B leads to C, can you conclude that B leads to C? So I'm going through with you on proof strategies. The first proof strategy that we had, we did what? Proof by contradiction. Right? Because we are saying that if there's a conflict, then that functional dependency cannot be set to hold. So for example, um, X to Z to X didn't work because I found an example that violated the rule. So that's a proof by contradiction. Now, this one is um, a proof by cases. Right? In other words, given this, someone says that A, B implies C. So this is proof method. Right? A, B implies C. Can you conclude that B also implies C? Right. To disprove it, you can say, okay, let me write you some examples. Right. So I'll write an example where I have A, B leading to C, and I have, okay, that I can also write this. But then, even though all three rules, my first rule satisfies the rule, A, B to C. Second rule satisfies it. That leads to C. I'm fine. Third one satisfies it. But then, even though all these are satisfying it, there is a violation at B to C. Because I want it to B to C and I want it to B to C. So another proof method you can do, if someone asks you to prove something about functional dependencies, you can give examples of what? Some things that hold, and then find a counterexample. Yes. So the thing is, assume that A B. So if A B determines C, is it true that B would also determine C? I think that maybe the example, the numbers I'm using, I can also do it this way. One, two determines three. That's the first one. Um, two, two determines three. Even the small one, I'm having here that if I put in this value and this value, so I have a pair that determines this. If you look at all my data, just even these two, it's still consistent. 
If you put these together, I get it. If you put, but then, as this one, even though this satisfies A, B to C, so I am generating data to put in there. I am finding that, oh, I have still not violated it enough. Okay, so let me do another one. I can do three, two, to four. This definitely is causing an issue. Because it's just one rule that I have, okay, very simple data. That will satisfy this. But it's causing an issue at B to C. Oh, because at B to C, one is two to three, one is two to four. Let's put in a real one. I will These two. This one, two to three. That one actually doesn't do anything in helping me solve this problem. Uh, wait, is there, oh wait, there's B to, oh yeah, there's B to C, and that's why there's B to G. And that's why there's a conflict. Because even though A, B gives you C, and D, B gives you G, the conflict is on these two. So what you have to do is make, to solve some of these, you'd have to make data that satisfies A, B to C, and then see if you can introduce a conflict. So let me use real columns so that people can follow, but let me use real columns. For example, I said, in this class, for example, hopefully everybody, there's, there are no two people in this class that have the same first name and last name. So um, if I did something like this, first name, last name, date of birth should give me your school ID. If someone came up with that. So I'll say if this holds, can you conclude that the date of birth gives you SID? That's why I say that sometimes, okay, this is not a good one. I have to pick one that makes logical sense, but okay. How about this? If I said first name, last name, and date of birth, based on these three, I combine them, I can find your student ID. Can I conclude that what? Last name will give me SID? No. Right. So I'm using real value. So I'm, I'm swapping between the two, but I'm hoping that by mid, by mid sem, you should be able to start reasoning about things without needing specific examples. That's what I'm trying to push your mind to. It's just like discrete math. In discrete math, too, or it may be in calculus, yes, it's good that you always have an example to, to anchor on. But at some point, you have to get to the stage where, even if they are just variables, same with programming, even if they are just variables, you can think about it and say, given my variables, I can still solve my problem if I know the algorithm to use or if I know the property I'm looking for. You can't, actually. So if I did this, maybe there is. So what the strategy was doing was you, you produce some sample data. For example, you can say, okay, Kofi Mensah, real person, maybe, born on the 2nd of June, um, 19, sorry, 79. His SID is... Right. I will also come up with someone else. So this is a valid rule. This is a valid person I can come up with. That means this criteria. Second person I can come up with, Ama Mensa, also born on the third, sorry, of July, nineteen seventy-seven, and his or her SID is one hundred two. These two data do satisfy the first part. As far as, okay, get me some people who satisfy first name, last name, date of birth, given SID. This would work. And yeah, in class I can pick people, and I'm sure I can identify most people in class this way. Right. But then, I can't just use, and actually on campus, this is an issue now. It's one of the reasons why your user names um, for staff, staff are few. You can do first initial, last name. But for students, we quickly moved away from first initial, last name, because it wasn't unique enough anymore. At first, when we were just maybe 30 students, it was great. Everybody had their own, like maybe uh, 
A Mensa, A Bar. It was very nice. But then once the population increased to a certain size, we are unable to use those few things to identify people. So now we have to say, well, let's combine first thing or last thing. But even now, and I think we are we're coming to some point where that will also fail. Where maybe we'll have to do, some schools are now doing first name, last name, and then year of enrollment. And hopefully, and in my school, I think even after the year, they'll add one, two, three, to indicate whether or not there were many people. So if you are zero, then you're like, yeah, I'm number one. If you get one, two, that means that in the application list, you weren't the first person by that first name, last name combination. So people are seeing the point. So this is an example of how to disprove something based on functional dependencies. You know functional dependence, but now you have to, have to think logically about it. So it means if someone can make a, a, an inference about this, anytime they see this, they will not force make that conclusion. It's the same thing. Yeah, so this one, 101 is leading, so men's son, the question is, this combination is leading to an SID. Which in class I can do if I pick up, or even the whole school, if I pick up your first name, last name, date of birth, I'm sure it is unique enough I can pick the student ID. Right. But the question is if I pick the last names, and on campus there are people whose last names are what? The same. So if I pick only the last name, can that lead me to an SID? No. That is what this question is asking. A, B to C, then B to C is just uh, more or less parameterized with variables. But this is an example using actual data, showing that something like this can't hold. And you can use this campus as an example. That you can use a combination of things to identify people, but you can't pick a sub of it to identify people. Meets this rule. First name, last name, date of birth gives you a side. That is also meeting the, the rule. So I'm using the. Oh, wait, three, the second. Okay, so that means that, um, for example, A can be first name, B can be last name, C can. Okay, this is even more complex. I've done with four columns. Right. The one here I'm giving you is using four columns instead of three. But it's the same principle from three. I can expand it to four to five. So the point is, if you have something where something determines something else. So maybe if I said, OK, um, I'm trying to find a good one. Mm. OK, since I'm getting hungry, maybe food will be what will satisfy. Do it. OK. <laughs> I will get an example around food. Okay. Um, ah, come on. I, I know I can, I can get some. I was thinking about the ingredients. How to put this? I seem to be doing a lot of ingredients today. Um, okay, this one. I have to think. I want to think of one as just two columns. Two. I just want to think of like, you have one, 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 two, but then you have two, three. Okay, so here, what you are doing is. Someone is giving you A, B, C and asking you to prove something about it. Right. So this is my first case. This is I. This is I, I. And this is the third one, I, I, I. What you are seeing is, even though all three, A, B, C, are satisfied in I, 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 and I, 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 the only way I can violate A, B to C is to do something like this. One, two, four. That is when I am blatantly violating A, B to C. Right. A, B, to C means if I pick A and B, it should lead me to a unique C. But if I do this, that means I'm really breaking the A, B, to C rule, right? But all I'm saying is even though the first three are still satisfying A, B, to C, even so, the first statement and the third statement are what? Creating a contradiction that will violate the B implies C. So I can't conclude because two goes to three in one case and two goes to four in another case. So you can't make that conclusion. And to try and solve that same one, I provided you a slightly more realistic one based on maybe even our campus. That if you combine the first name, last name, and date of birth, we are sure we can identify 
exactly your student ID. So we are hoping that there are no two people whose first name, last name, date of birth are the same. That even if your first name, last name are the same, maybe your date of birth will be different. And that's what we are doing. And we're saying that if something like that were to hold, you can't conclude, for example, that last name should give you student ID. Which kindly holds? We kindly can't conclude that if we have a last name, it should lead to a unique student. So this is a logical extension based on that rule. That concept that if I have A, B implies C, I can't imply that A, I can't say A implies C. That's not going to work. I can't say B implies C. That's not going to work. And discrete math people have something like that there too as well. Where you say if this and this should give you this. You can't assume that it gives part of it. So if someone says, oh, if I come to Accra and I have money, I'll take you out to lunch. If I come to Accra and I don't have money, you can't force me to take you to lunch. But if the two things are satisfied, yeah, you have the right to say, okay, you told me that oh, if you come to Accra and you have money, take me out to lunch. But just one of them, I can't, so it's the same thing that you are seeing in logic. You can't just say, oh, if I come to Accra, he'll take you to lunch. Or if he has money, he'll take you to lunch. That's not what he said. He said if he comes to Accra and he has money, he'll take you out to lunch. So that is what this is more or less representing. Okay, so this is another proof method. So this is another one, which is written, it's just an extension, similar one. If someone tells you that, okay, is it true that boys cannot clean? It's just that what? You have to list some boys, and then some boys can't clean, some boys can clean. So you just need what? If you find one boy who is violating the rule, not well, it's a good rule to violate. I, I should make you more boys. Let me add more, especially for myself. So this is also proved by contradiction. So it is mixing. So you are trying to find, remember that um, proved by contradiction, usually you find some case that violates the rule. Right? So proved by contradiction is actually a type of, but um, in this treatment, when we said cases, that means you have to enumerate all the possibilities or all groups of possibilities. In this case, we are not enumerating all. We are just picking a few. So if we say, okay, prove that boys cannot clean, then you say, okay, if A is a boy, then B cannot clean, then you can say, okay, I have some boys, right? And then I also have some cleaning, then you list. But the moment you find some which contradicts the original premise you made, then you can say, oh, you know what? I have disproved what you asked me, right? So that is the concept. It's the same thing I did before, except that now it's just two columns. <coughs> so that's another exciting thing. <coughs> this one, everybody is comfortable with, because people have heard about transitivity before. In some way or form, if A implies B and B implies C, then A implies C. I think you've seen this in many forms. Everyone is cool with this one. I hope everyone is okay with this one, transitivity. Let me write it another way. Um, if um, X is a boy, that is it, where you say one thing leads to another, and there's also what? So if X is a boy, and boys have beards, then X has a beard. And this one, you can keep continuing it. And if you have a beard, you can say um, people with beards shave, right? Then, of course, X has a beard, but I can also conclude that what? X shaves, right? So, transitivity just means that there are things that lead to another. X, X leads to boy, boy leads to beard, beard leads to shaving. That means that what? X, is, X has a beard, X also shapes. So there are some rules that what, can change, right? There are many. Maybe if you come to Ashesi, you are an honest person. Honest people don't steal. Therefore, people who come to Ashesi don't steal. <laughs> right? To violate it, that means that what? You have to go and find, to disprove it, you have to find for me an example. Oh, that would violate that one. Until then, I can just say, well, as far as I'm concerned, 
That will help. I hope people are getting an idea yeah. for transitivity. Okay. This is the last room. It's slightly more complex, but we'll take a look at it quickly. Yes, the same thing. The same. That's why I said that if you like math, after a while, it will all become the same. And then the course is, so we expect the grades to start going up at some point. Because the things will be repeating. From database, if you go and take e-commerce, if you are fine, you should be doing well. If you've done web tech and you do e-commerce, you should be expecting that you should be doing well. We are expecting that that knowledge to also transfer to your final project, you should be doing well. Right, so we expect that, actually, the more, the longer you stay, the better you should get. Especially if the subjects are similar. For computer science, I think the subjects tend to be similar. So if programming one, you did well. Or even if you didn't do well, by programming two, some people start to pick up. Because some things, guess what? They repeat. Same concept. Okay, so decomposition is the last one. Where you say that if X determines, X provides YZ. So this is decomposition. In other words, you can, you can split it. Then you can also conclude that X determines Y. That is just very simple. If something determines two things, then it determines what? Each of them separately. So that is decomposition. So there was a rule that was doing combining. So we were saying that you can, sorry. This is the reverse of, if someone says X determines Y and X determines Z, you should be able to conclude that X determines what? Y and Z. So this is the reverse of that. Saying that if something determines two things, then that can what, also be split into two. So from here, I can also conclude, if x determines y and z, I can conclude that x determines y. I can also conclude that x determines z. So these are just what? Ways that we reason about data. If you can think in these terms, you expect that what? Anytime you're doing any analysis on data, you should be fine. I've already showed you the traps. The first trap was, um, Oh, there was one trap that I just showed. Sorry. This trap. Where you are giving something, and you are thinking that just because the two things end in the same place, then this doesn't imply this. So that's one of the things you have to watch for. Right. And the other one is, anytime someone tells you something determines something, like, if someone says X determines Y, just check to see that what, there's no violation. So that's really what you have to be watching out for. Watching for the violations and watching for false positives. Where something like, where you, oh, I think it holds but it really doesn't. Or you think, oh, something is being violated, but it's not being violated. So those are the two you have to watch out for. Okay. So using these, there are others, okay, so there's union, that's kind of boring. But let's move on to, sorry, using this to do normalization, transitivity, there's one in the book called pseudo transitivity, but I'll do that one next time. Since today, since people are already like at their max with this. So, let's switch. So I have some data here. Sorry. Can it get a little bit bigger, bigger? And what we would like to do is to normalize this information. This is normalization means that you should be able to, so there are many uh, forms of normalization. Right? So the first one is We'll talk about first normal form. So if you hear the term first normal form, that means that every single word data has been put into a unique cell. Right. In this data that we have, there are some empty cells. Right. So in order to turn this into first normal, that means that what? And this, I think you see this in some, maybe you go to um, some of the banks, they are recording information, and you see that maybe someone is signing for a check. He writes his name and then he will just write all the check numbers. He doesn't what? He doesn't repeat the information. Right? 
Or maybe you are buying something at a store. The store owner will just write your name and then a list of items that you bought. It could be in this form, meaning that it's still not in the first normal form because some cells should have data but don't. It's different from when I mean that, oh, it's really empty. But in this case, it's not empty. There's an implied, for human beings, when we see something like this, we normally assume, I think this is also common for a lot of the law books. Um, I don't know if you, you visited some security checkpoints. They just write the date and then they write your, you just write your name. People don't normally keep repeating the date over and over. They just assume that once the date is there, everyone just does like comma, comma, and it means that everybody there is on that date, right? So to turn this into first normal form, it means that first of all, we are going to have to what? Put, so if this row, it is true that 105 should be with four, then I should make sure that I copy 105 to these places, I copy 104 to these locations, 101 to these locations as well. So, Hey, it's not capturing my mouse. That is very exciting. Okay. All right. So 105 to uh, 225, 203. They should be copied what? Down here as well. So for first normal form, if someone says, get me data in first normal form, it means that any place where there was supposed to be data, I put it in. The other thing, so this example doesn't have that. But in normalization, the other thing you have to watch out for is when someone puts a lot of information, so, for example, we ask you to provide me a phone number, and someone will enter three phone numbers, right? Or maybe a uh, service name, and someone will just put keep in. Like here, maybe just, sorry. Oh, my mouse is vanishing. Okay, here it is. Instead of just bookkeeping, someone will do something like bookkeeping stroke partnership. For first normal form, you have to what? Break all of those. But if I did something like that, it just means that what I have to repeat, since I want to record information, I'll have to repeat everything in that row in the next one. So for example, so the two things you have to watch out for. Come on. Excel, 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 hurry up. Ribbon should collapse. So this is just playful data. So if you are doing first normal form, if you see what information that is what repeated, you treat it as though you were going to insert into a table, but you have to make sure that what you don't keep two values in the same place. So something like this, I'll have to repeat the coffee, but for one of them, I'll record the first value, and for one of them, sorry. Okay, so I have to keep the first one there. All right. So for first normal form, it means that if I have information that is like this, where I have two or three values in one location or in one cell, in one column, I'll have to what, split it and turn it into this. Are people cool? So you can see here that what? Here, you wanted to write Kofi, that phone number, Kofi, the second phone number. But the person in writing, so this is something you, you see in practice. If you go to some companies and they're asked to fill forms, some people can fill, hmm, three people can fill one slot because everyone wants to. You say, oh, okay, well, we are all here. Add that phone number, add that phone number. But if you are going to record it into, if you are thinking of moving to a database, such information like this one, Okay, like this, isn't going to work. Because let's say it's an integer that you are able to store, right? This wouldn't work for you. Because now someone is providing two values. How do you put them in there, right? So the way you work with it is you would repeat the row. On one row, you provide one of the values. On the second row, you provide what? The second value. So to normalize, to first normal form. So the goal of first normal form is to get 
all of the data. Right? Everybody should be unique. Everybody, every value should be in a unique cell. And as I also mentioned, someone could also do this. Shenu could enter and he would say, oh, but I meant that this phone number was mine as well. Some people also do this. And as I said, you would, this is a snapshot from a logbook. And it's showing that human beings do this a lot as well. When we are writing, we tend to not repeat ourselves. We would like not to do it. So normally we write two columns. And when things are repeating, what? We ignore the earlier columns and just keep on, we just continue. Right. And what I'm saying there is for something like that, sorry, where is it? For something like that as well, that means that in my second place, I'll have to what? Properly correct it and put the person's number there. So Chin also provided two numbers. But then I have to make sure that in normalizing, I provide it this way, where every cell contains just what? One value. So if someone sends you to go and normalize some data, that's the first step. Some say data cleaning, but it's a very painful thing. Right? Before we start building databases. It's less than 30 minutes. Yeah. Okay. You still have time. Yeah. Oh. Okay, so how many people couldn't how many people couldn't log in? Okay, so I have one, two, three. So that means for, for five people. Okay, please, hands up, please, just to make sure. So there's one, two, three, four. Okay, five. Only five people. Okay. Some people can't log in. Okay, how many people? You couldn't log in at all, right? You couldn't connect, but you can log in. So that means today everybody can log in to the machine, the remote machine, with party. Everybody. The first one. Everyone can, can log in. But it's just when you're trying to use your database that you can't. Okay. All right. So what I'll do is I'm going to put this up. I'm going to put this specific one online. Right? And what I'll have you do as an assignment coming in Wednesday is, given this information, I'd like to find all the possible functional dependencies. Right? So you look at it and see if you can find what? some functional dependencies. So this will go up for you as an assignment. You have to expand it okay. and clean it up. Okay. So if you go to any, so for example, if you're going to build something for a company or something, they'll give you some sample data like this. Okay. And what your job is, before you start finding a functional dependencies, is you have to break every single place where legal data is there. So this, for example, you supposed to bring the date, he omitted it. You are going to bring it. If someone wrote, for example, tax planning, stroke, something, that means he wants to put two things. They should have been on two different rows. But he put everything in one place. In that case, what? You write the two rows for the person and you separate the data properly. So that's the first normal form. So I'll put this up and your assignment for Wednesday is to what? Find the functional dependency. You can do this in 10 minutes. That means we'll be due Wednesday morning. Oh, it doesn't take a long time. You can do this in, what, 10 minutes? I can, I can even tell you some right now. You can look at it. What's on Wednesday? Oh, this one. You do this for me today before you sleep. <laughs> then everyone will be happy. Just, just for this table. For this table to find what? The functional dependencies. Please, these things, by now, you should be fast. Fast, fast. Because if you go to work for somebody or you are, you know, at a meeting and someone is asking, oh, sir, what are some of the, or oh, madam, what are some of the rules that you can see? Very quickly, you look up and you start to wow them. You say, oh, you know what? Given the information I'm looking at, I think that service type gives you, you know, you can do it very quickly. It's not difficult. You have to have confidence that you can do this in 30 minutes or less. All right. So please, the people who couldn't connect, the class has ended. Come forward, those who couldn't connect, and let's deal with your connection issues. Has been solved. I am asked yesterday if not, come and let's solve it. I think it might be the internet, so I'm trying to connect using. Are you sure? Yes, because I wasn't able to connect. Okay, so let's.